Hey everyone, Jean Paul here, and you're watching the third video of the Video Sync mini series. In the previous videos, we looked at installing Video Sync, making it run over a network, the workflow, and the instruments. And with this last one, I want to tie it all together by covering the effects and showing some example projects. So, without further ado, here they all are. I split them into two categories, basic and advanced, and my thought behind that was that the top effects are usually easy to understand and use from the get-go, while the bottom effects are a bit more complex and may require a bit more background information. Now there's one effect here in particular that looks a little bit different, and that's the latest addition of the bunch, Wavy. All right, let's just begin with an empty set. And as we go on, I'll show a couple of other projects to give a few different perspectives of the work and signal flow. I have the OK video loaded in, so let's grab a bloom blur effect from the effects folder, put it on the channel, trigger the clip, and let's link the horizontal and vertical blurring. And there we go. That was easy. Now, what if we want to add a second video? Let's say this glass ladder one, and let's trigger that. And let's say we want to change the color of both of these videos combined. For that, we can group the two channels and let's go back to the user library, the effects, take the hue saturation effect, put it on the group channel and change the hue. This effect does not have a dry wet control, however, but just like with audio, we can create one using an audio effect rack. So I group the device, add a dry chain, and assign both volume parameters to the same macro with opposite minimum and maximum values, and boom, we have our own dry wet control. We could also instead add additional chains to do parallel processing, however the chain selector here on the right is not yet supported, but that could be something cool in the future. Let's move on to return channels, which we can also use for parallel processing, or better, we can create feedback loops like we're seeing right now. For this, I have a squares instrument with a grid of two by two and the square size is set to 25%. There's two notes being triggered in the clip, one for the top left corner and another for the bottom left corner. Then the next device is transform, which can be used to reposition an image, scale it up or down or rotate it. This one only moves the entire image to the left. So the squares hit the edge of the screen. Then next is a color control device, which has a lot of options, but in its current state, it simply turns all bright pixels into pink. The interesting part ultimately happens here in the return channels. So we're going to send this channel to return A, and then we'll notice another two squares appearing on the screen. Let me show you why. If we open the device chain of return A, we see another transform device, which moves the incoming image slightly to the right and slightly lower. Then there's a hue device which ever so slightly changes the color of the squares that were moved. And when we send this signal into return B and return B back into A, we create a feedback loop where the squares are continuously being multiplied and moved to the lower right. And the result is something we're familiar with. Now if I go to my browser, I have an interesting LFO preset prepared and I'll put it on the return channel as well. And I'll map this LFO to the scale parameter. Now watch what happens. We get this really pumping zooming effect that is matched to the tempo of the project and we can adjust the depth on the LFO to get some more variety. Now ask yourself whether you want to be able to do these kind of things during your live performance or if it would be better to record this so you can use it as a pre-recorded video to minimize real-time video processing. In order to record the output of Video Sync, we'll have to go to the preferences of Video Sync, enable Master Siphon Out, and then use the Siphon Recorder app, which is free and there's a link to it in the description of this video. Here we are in another project with some rotating squares, which are being generated by the squares instrument over here. And we have a grid of six by four. So that means we have 24 squares on our screen and our starting note is C3. Now, if we look into our MIDI clip over here, we see a lot of C3, 16 of them to be exact in a one bar loop. 
Those 16 notes are all going into this random MIDI effect, which adds 24 possible choices on top of that C3. So we get a random note out of those 24 choices out of this MIDI effect going into the squares instrument. And that's how we get those squares to appear on random locations on the screen. Then next we have the brightness contrast, which is just adding a little bit of brightness. And it's very subtle, but it's there. Then there's the transform device, which we can use to reposition or rescale the image. But in this case, we only change the anchor point around which the image rotates. The rotation parameter, however, is being modulated by the Max for Life LFO over here. We can remove that modulation by hitting the X, and now we can rotate it manually. And as you can see, we can also change the anchor point around which it rotates. So let's go back and let's map this one again. There we go, we got a rotation back. And then we have a blur effect, which simply adds some blurring. And once we bypass it, we can see the actual squares with their sharp corners. Something else that has become much more obvious though are the different colors. And the first responsible element for this can be found in the gradient channel over here. So let's solo this one. And now we don't see anything and that's because of the properties device. So let's just disable that for a second. And this is the image. It's just a still image, but I turned it into a video because we cannot work with images in Ableton Live. Uh, so it's just a loop of a still image. And properties right here, the blend mode is set to mask, which means that the brightness of the pixels of this video determine how bright the pixels of the layers below it will be. So if I turn solo off, we'll see that this layer comes in and we'll see that the edges of the image are slightly darker because of the gradient and the mask. But we're not done yet because there's still that very obvious dark green, which is caused by the effects here on the master channel. So we have another brightness contrast, which slightly increases the brightness. And then we have the color control device. And this one simply splits the current image, um, the brightness, into two different bands. So we have a light band and a mid band. And the light band, as you can see, is beige and the mid band is green. And we can set at what percent the midpoint should be. So right now the midpoint is at 20% brightness, which means that as soon as a pixel is at 20% brightness, it will start to turn green as it fades out. Then here I have a project with some musical elements in it as well. Everything that has to do with video sync happens here in the drum bus on the drum rack channel. And currently we have four chains on this drum rack, four pads in use of which three are doing video. The perk one is just doing audio. These are just separate layers, by the way, and with that I mean that they don't have any influence on each other as the blending modes for all the channels are set to additive. So let's see what those separate layers do, because on each chain we have an instrument rack and in that instrument rack, we have an audio simpler for, in this case, the kick. And then here we have a video simpler with a couple of effects. So let me turn those off real quick. And then we can see what this original video actually looks like. So let's solo the kick. And then we see a growing circle, a white circle. And the brightness is not always the same. That's because it's sensitive to velocity. And if we look into the MIDI clip here, we can see that the kicks are indeed not always the same velocity. So let's go back. And there's a small uh, fade out time every time a note hits. So that's why it fades out at the edges. And first we have a color control right here, which controls the color and the brightest pixels will remain whitish. And as they grow darker, they become red. Then the transform device slightly increases the size of the circles. And then we have a feedback to create some trails and a blurring effect to slightly blur the circle. And then we have the source here, which is all the way open. Let's close that. And the gain set to two, the default value is one, but as you can see, it's not as bright now. So let's set it back to two. And I like the, um, the sharp lines of the original circle, which, which are gone now, but if we increase the source here, we get those back. So that's quite nice. Now, if we add the snare, we get some nice rays through the image. Let's take a look at those and what's causing those. Oops, needs to go to the left. Um, so another audio simpler for the snare, of course, and then a video. And this is strange because it says drop video here, but there is in fact a video loaded in there. 
Um, let's get this back here. So we have a video simpler here and this video simpler is set into the slice mode, which means that the first note is a C1 and a C3 is coming in here, of course. So I needed to lower the pitch of that MIDI note by two octaves. And then I added a random effect that adds 24 possible MIDI notes on top of that C1. So we get a different slice from this video to play back on the screen because of this slice by region mode. And for more info on Simpler, the link in the top right will take you to another video. Okay, so if we turn off the effects, then we can see the actual hiccup tester again, the white line moving across the screen. And the first blurring effect adds a lot of gain. So if I set this back to one, you can see there's a lot of very dark white lines in the background, but if we increase the gain, we get them back. And there's a high vertical blur distance, no horizontal blurring though, and only two passes. So now we have some very sharp lines and I wanted to blur them again a little bit. So here's another blur effect, uh, which is much more subtle. And then a color control, which adds those nice yellow orangey colors that match with the kick. Then lastly, we have the tom. And here we go. Another video here in the simpler. So let's take a look at what that looks like again. And let's just solo this for a second. And then all there's left to see is this white waveform, which fades out slowly with every note. Then there's a transform device, which increases the image size and rotates the image by 90 degrees. Then a feedback device, which causes some echoing. And then a crop device, so the echoing doesn't go too far. I wanted it to stay mostly centered. And then the keyer device, which is in luma mode which means that the threshold here determines at what brightness the image will be filled with other video content. So that's what this fill video channel is here for. It's just a video, the fluff video, which is looping all the time. And only when the tom plays, we can actually see that video in the area that was white before, thanks to the keyer device. So that's great. And then again, we can blur that and then combine that with the snare and the kick. And there we go. Let's move on. This lightning cloud is pretty interesting. Pretty much everything you see here is being done with video sync, and I'm only using one pre-recorded video of a gradient, just like earlier. The project consists of four channels, of which two are in a group, which has some effects on it, and there is one return channel, also with some effects. Let's take a closer look at the individual channels, starting with the first one called Mask here. So let's solo that and hit play. As you can see, we only get two white squares, and it's because we only have two notes. And here on the second channel, we have the exact same thing, but for the right side of the screen. So left side of the screen, right side of the screen. Both of these channels are muted, so we don't actually get to see those white squares, but they're used by other effects down the line. So I'll get to that in just a bit. So the next thing is the group channel here. And if we turn off all the effects, we can take a look at what's inside the group. So here's the gradient video that I mentioned earlier, which again just is a video of a still image. And then this image is cropped, so we get a red spot in just the center. Here's something more interesting, and let's hit play again. Again we have a squares instrument and a bunch of effects, starting with the crop effect, because I wanted the squares just to appear in the center which I could have also done by just changing the MIDI notes, but yeah. So then a blur effect to blur those squares a little bit. And then we have the new effect, wavy. And as you can see, we're getting something that looks like lightning, which is really nice. And then the brightness contrast that makes it a lot brighter. So let me put a wavy effect on the gradient right here. So it's a little bit more obvious what's happening to the image. So let's increase the amount, and as you can see, we are getting some distortions in the image. We can set the scale of these distortions by zooming out like this and zooming back in. Uh, we can add some stationary motion, as I like to call it. And if we really increase the scale, we can see it much better. And then we can add some movement in a certain direction. So currently the direction is 133 degrees. And we can really speed that up and change the direction, as I said. So let's slow it back down. 
and we can set it on complex mode instead of eco and get a lot more details. And we can crossfade between square shapes and round shapes. So that's the wavy effect. It's really nice. And if we move on to the group now, we can take a closer look at what's happening. So let's press play. And as you can see, we're getting some weird movement on the left side of the screen where those white squares used to be. So this displacement device uses the first channel, mask, for the displacement map. This means that as it is in luminance mode, the brightness of pixels in that sidechain signal determine the amount of displacement. As the white squares fade out, the amount of displacement changes and that's what's causing the movement that we're seeing. The top dial controls the horizontal displacement, where positive means right and negative means left, and the bottom dial the vertical displacement, where positive is top and negative is bottom. So then we have the exact same thing for the right side of the screen. And this displacement effect is using the second channel. Then that is cropped and blurred. And then again we have the wavy effect, which turns it into a mad little thunderstorm again. And then we can add some feedback to that, to add some more brightness and trailing. And then lastly, the hue saturation device, which takes some color out of the image by lowering the saturation. Okay. Then to finish things up, I like to make it a little bit more interesting to look at with this return channel over here. And I'm using the send here on the group. And I'm going to send it all the way in. Um, and as you can see, we have a crop device here. So let's solo the return channel. And this is what we get from that. So it's being cropped, being blurred, and then a very low saturation to make it white. And then there is just the normal max for life LFO here again. And I can use this one to modulate the send over here. And then we get some nice flashing going on in the center of the screen. So if we turn solo off, we can see now that the center of the screen has some brighter moments and some darker moments. Okay, that's it, the end of this series. I hope it was helpful for you. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to use the comment section. And I hope to see you again in another video. Bye.